something you might not know about Canada. Hi, I'm Don Tapscott, and before the break, I promised to tell you about the digital office. In the 1970s, the coolest decade of all time, the office was full of strange things like typewriters, dictaphones, adding machines, and mimeographs. Telephones were connected to a wire, so people could only reach you when you were in the office. God, I miss that. Not now! In 1978, the Canadian company Bell Northern Research wondered what would happen if every desk had a computer on it connected to a vast internetwork. Their incredibly handsome staff created an office that used crazy things like email, word processing, texting, and document management. Then BNR pitted the computerized workers against the computerless old school test group. This first ever controlled experiment proved that the digital workers were more efficient, innovative, and effective. And they had more fun too. And within only 15 years, office workers across the globe were playing electronic solitaire and watching cat videos to their heart's content. And that's something you might not know about Canada. Hi, and welcome to the opening talk here at South by Southwest. Um, thanks for braving the rain to come out. And I want to let everyone know that Don's doing a, a, a book signing and little meet and greet at the South by Southwest bookstore right after this talk if you, if you want to introduce yourself and say hello. Don is one of the world's leading authorities on innovation, media, and the economic and social impact of technology, and advises businesses and government leaders around the world. He has authored or co-authored 14 widely read books, including the 1992 bestseller, Paradigm Shift. His 1995 hit, The Digital Economy, changed thinking around the world about the transformational nature of the internet. And two years later, he defined net generation and the digital divide in the book, Growing Up Digital. His 2000 work, Digital Capital, introduced seminal ideas like the business web and was described as business week, by Business Week as pure enlightenment. Wikinomics, How Mass Collaboration Changes Everything, was the best-selling management book in the United States in 2007 and was translated into over 25 languages. The Economist called his newest work, Macro Wikinomics, Rebooting Business and the World, a Schumpeterian story of creative destruction. And the Huffington Post said the book is nothing less than a game plan to fix a broken world. Over 30 years, he has introduced many groundbreaking concepts that are a part of contemporary understanding. In 2011, Don was renamed the Thinkers 50 definitive list of the top 50 business thinkers in the world, earning the ninth spot on the list. He was also the runner-up as the world's leading thinker on globalization, and Macro Wikinomics was runner-up for the best business, business book of the last two years. He's a member of the World Economic Forum, adjunct professor of management at the Rotman School of Management at the University of Toronto, and a Martin Prosperity Institute fellow. It's hard to imagine anyone who has had been more prolific, more profound, or more influential in explaining the digital revolution and the impact on the world. Ladies and gentlemen, Dom Tapscott. Well, good afternoon and congratulations to all of you for getting through the lineups and the rain and everything else to get here. I love working with diehards. Um, by the way, the uh, hashtag for this particular event is South by SX Rethink Civ, and um, I'm at DTapscott on Twitter. In the next uh, 45 minutes, then we'll have a conversation, but in the next 45 minutes, I'd like to convince you of the following idea that due to some big changes with technology, demographics, society, business, and the global economy, we're moving into a new period in human history. And on the table is nothing less than the rebuilding of the institutions of civilization and of human civilization itself. And the stakes are very, very high that we do that. And I'd like to begin with an institution of civilization, our institutions for solving global problems. These came out of the period after the Second World War, Bretton Woods, when we had the creation of the UN and the GATT and the World Bank and the IMF and the WTO and soon the G20 and the G8 and so on. These institutions are failing at solving problems in the world. So take something like climate change. 
uh, Bill Clinton was saying uh, to a group of us at Davos that if we reduce carbon emissions by 80% in the year 2050, not by 6%, by 80%, it'll take a thousand years for the planet to cool down. And in the meantime, some bad things will happen. Like you can expect a billion and a half people to lose half of their water supply in the next 10 to 20 years. This is a big problem. So all of our global institutions, based on nation states, they go off to Cancun and Copenhagen and they try and make a deal, and they can't. But meanwhile, there are probably 15 to 20 million people using the internet to self-organize around this issue. And they're not just Malcolm Gladwell's slacktivists that say like on Facebook and think they're changing the world. They're people doing something, architects figuring out how to retrofit old buildings and kids in schoolyards trying to reduce the carbon in their districts. This is the first time in human history where the world is being mobilized and we're all on the same side. We've been mobilized around world wars before, but we were on different sides. So the killer app for the internet may turn out to be saving the planet, literally. Now let's go to this week's big development, the Stop Coney uh, 2012 campaign. Who here has seen this video? Okay. Uh, who has not seen this video? Hands, please. Okay. That's about 50-50. All of you who said you've not seen the video, you will have seen the video in the next week or so. When I first watched it, um, less than four days ago, there were 20,000 people who'd seen it. Uh, last time I checked, there were uh, 56 million people who've seen this video. Now, Joseph Coney is a bad guy, and uh, that's to put it uh, mildly. He's uh, the head of a Christian liberation uh, movement uh, that was uh, uh, based in Angola, and he's recruited up to 66,000 young people to be part of this, children. And recruited is not the right word. He kidnaps them and kills their families. And um, the young boys become soldiers and the women become sex slaves. And if you uh, don't cooperate, you get your face cut off and your ears cut off. And uh, many thousands of uh, kids have been mutilated this way. So there's a campaign that's been launched to make Joseph Coney famous, to let the world know about Joseph Coney. And he's a very famous man as of uh, today. Now, this is a powerful, this is all based on the internet, very powerful example. It's a 30 minute movie that's been watched by tens of millions of people. It's a powerful example of how the internet drops transaction and collaboration costs and enables us to come together to do extraordinary things. But it raises a bunch of interesting issues. If this is a new model of solving a global problem, it may be very powerful, but is it legitimate? Who is it accountable to? You can say what you like about the UN, at least it's sort of accountable to somebody. How do you get to participate? How do you get to decide the policies of this movement? One of the things the movement is arguing is that the US military people should uh, be in Uganda and they should be helping hunt down and kill this guy or arrest uh, this guy, Joseph Kony. Is that a good idea? Now, overall, I have to tell you, I think the, the bottom line is that this is a very powerful thing. But it's a great case in point, and it's happening right now. While I'm speaking, since I began speaking, many thousands of people saw this video for the first time. And it, it, it's a great case in point about the new challenges that we have rebuilding a new set of networked institutions to enable us to be a civilization, to create wealth, to have good government, to solve problems, to be healthy, to be prosperous. Now, let's face it, the world is broken. I mean, who would have imagined four years ago, let's talk about the global economy now, that one of the big themes of business books would be how to save capitalism, or is capitalism even savable? And these books are not being written by radicals, they're being written by people like uh, Matthew Bishop and Michael Green, business editors at The Economist, written a book called The Road from Ruin. 
The first time I, it struck me that something big was going on here was in 2008, and it was the week that the financial system collapsed, and I happened to be speaking to a group called Cybos. This is an annual meeting of 7,000 bankers, and so it was a room like, like over twice the size of this full of bankers, and I looked out at this sea of deer in the headlights, and um, it occurred to me, Bob Dylan, there's something going on here and you don't know what it is. The collapse of the financial services industry wasn't a blip. The core modus operandi of Wall Street almost brought down global capitalism. But it hasn't changed yet. Now, how are we going to move forward in the world? Well, you know this guy Paul Krugman, Nobel Prize winning economist, writes for the New York Times. For some reason, I've ended up speaking at the same conference as him a few times uh, recently. And he gets up, and I paraphrase, he says essentially, when you have the meltdown of a global financial industry, you get a couple of decades of ugliness. Japan had one in 1992. They still are in a slump. So get ready for two decades of awful global economic activity. And that's the good news scenario, he says, because some bad things can happen, like Spain or Italy defaults on its sovereign debt, and Angela Merkel and, the, and uh, Germany doesn't come in to shore up the euro. The euro collapses, Europe goes into a depression, the whole global economy goes into a depression. Now, far be it from me to debate a Nobel Prize winning economist, but I have a slightly different perspective. To me, the future is not something to be predicted. The future is something to be achieved. And we can achieve a very different future than the one that Krugman outlines. But if we're going to do that, we need to know what the problem is. And the problem doesn't fall within the, the paradigm of traditional economists who worry about things like the business cycle. Should we have more austerity or more fiscal stimulation or whatever? This is not a cyclical change that we're going through in the world today. It's a secular change. This crisis is a punctuation point in human history. And uh, that's the topic of, uh, of my new book with uh, Anthony Williams called Macroeconomics. By the way, the best way to get this book is in massive volume. So, <laughs> you look like people with friends. Christmas is coming soon. No, seriously. You have a look around. These are chapters of the book. We have many institutions today that are in various stages of being stalled or frozen, or an atrophy, or even failing, contrasted with the contours of a set of sparkling new initiatives to rebuild that institution around a new communications medium and a new set of principles. The Industrial Age Corporation, typified by General Motors, America's greatest company, it went bankrupt. Newspapers are going under. Uh, 70 newspapers have gone bankrupt in the last decade. As one youngster said to us, if the news is important, it will find me. I mentioned our systems for global problem solving. They can't. Universities and schools. We have the very best model of education that 17th century technology can provide. Now, all of these institutions are based on the industrial age model. You know the model, right? Something in the center at the top pushes out something down to passive recipients. It's one way, it's one size fits all, it's one to many, it's controllable. So whether that's a company pushing out standardized products where scale and, and um, standardization is key, or whether it's a, a, a media company pushing out uh, newspapers or radio broadcasts or television uh, broadcasts or in a lecture theater in a university, you know? It's the industrial age model. I'm a teacher, I have knowledge. You're a student, you're an empty vessel, you don't. Get ready. Here it comes. But I'm the source of knowledge. And, and your goal is to take it into short-term active working memory and through practice and repetition to build deeper cognitive structures so that you can recall it to me when I test you. And there'll be plenty of that. Drill and kill. Sage on the stage. To me, the lecture is the process whereby, whereby the notes of a lecture go to the notes of a student without going through the brains of either. Now, I appreciate the irony that I'm standing up here yeah. giving you a lecture. <laughs> but you know what? You're not going to remember much of this. You're not going to remember the 16 institutions of the five principles of the seven uh, new models for transformation. 
I'm just trying to convince you of a single idea and motivate you to do something differently. So, if you want to understand what's happening today, again, with respect to Krugman, I don't think you go back to 1992 or 1981 or even the Great Depression. You need to go back earlier into human history. All around the world, a couple of hundred, few hundred years ago, we had a feudal economy. And uh, it was an agrarian age. And knowledge was concentrated in tiny oligopolies, the church and the, and the state. And people, they just didn't know about things. There was no concept of progress. You were born, you lived your life, then you died. And then along came Johannes Gutenberg with his great invention. And over time, people began to acquire knowledge. And when they did, the institutions of feudal agrarian society appeared to be, to many, to be stalled or frozen or an atrophy or even failing. It didn't make sense for the church to be responsible for medicine when people had knowledge. It didn't make sense for a bunch of kings and nobles to be running everything. So we saw the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther called the printing press God's highest act of grace. We saw the creation of, the, of, 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 of modern institutions like the university and science and so on, part of, of new models of government. And it was all good. Eventually, it led to the Industrial Revolution. It advanced the global economy and our standard of living and our health. But it came with a cost. And now, once again, the technology genie is out of the bottle. This time, of course, South by Southwest I, interactive, it's very different. The printing press gave us access to the written word. The internet enables each of us to be a producer. The printing press gave us access to recorded knowledge. The internet enables us to get access not just to knowledge, but to the intelligence contained in the crania of other people on a global basis. This is not an information age that we're going into. It's an age of networked intelligence. It's one of collaboration and one of participation. Now, what I just told you on the slide here, these ideas have been around for a long time. As you can see from that video of that incredibly handsome guy in 1978, I've been writing about this stuff for 30 years. These were ideas in waiting. And it wasn't just me. Some of you may have read a book by Alvin Toffer called The Third Wave. That's got to be 30 years old. Talked about an agrarian industry. I think he called it an information age. We can cut him some slack for that. These ideas, their time has not come, had not come. But now they have. There are four big developments that are leading us into nothing less than a rebuilding of our institutions and of our civilization. The first you all know about, and I'm going to be brief here. Um, we have the new web, and this ain't your daddy's internet, as they might say in Texas. Uh, the old web was based on HTML, and it was a platform for the presentation of content. In some ways, it was a continuation of the old media, printing press, radio, television. It was about somebody who creates a website and presents content. That's why during the dot-com period, everybody said content is king, and it's all about eyeballs and stickiness and clicks and page views and dot-coms and so on, because that's what the web was. Now we have a ubiquitous global computational platform enriched with services that's multimedia, that's mobile, that's high in bandwidth, and we have billions, soon trillions of inert objects that become smart communicating devices. The physical world is becoming smart. My hotel here, uh, the, the, uh, the door has a chip in it. It's inter-networked. It's a new hotel. And I I'm betting the door not only would have knowledge, it has an IP address. Uh, and I had a camera stolen from a hotel room in Miami, and the door knew about me. It knew who'd been in and out of the room. We actually found an unauthorized access. I have a friend in Toronto. Everything in his house that has electrical power has an IP address, and all these things talk to each other. I have no idea what his refrigerator says to his toaster, but um, he was actually bragging that his fence talks to his sprinkler. And I said, well, Ken, why would you care? He says, well, Don, if a burglar comes over the fence, the sprinkler is my first line of defense. <laughs> so this is pervasive ambient computing. That's point number one. It's a platform, a computational platform. We're all using this big computer. And when we do, we program it, and it enables us to collaborate. 
Theme number two is there's a demographic revolution. Um, who here is under the age of 33? Hands, please. Okay. Who here has kids under the age of 33? Okay, that covers off just about everybody, so I can be brief on this too. Um, I started studying kids about 15 years ago when I noticed how my own children were effortlessly able to use all, use all this sophisticated technology. And at first I thought, my children are prodigies. Uh, but then I noticed that all their friends were like them, so that was a bad theory. So I started working with 300 kids and I wrote this book on uh, Growing Up Digital 1997. Flash forward to today, they're not just growing up digital, they've grown up. They're in this room. They're coming into the workforce, the marketplace, into society, and there's no more powerful force to change every institution than a new generation of digital natives. I'm a digital immigrant. I had to learn the language. Now, this is a very unique time in history. This is the first time ever when children are an authority about something really important. Think about that one. I was an authority on model trains when I was 11. Today, the 11-year-old at the breakfast table is an authority on this revolution that's changing every institution. You know, in the 60s, those of you who are around, we had a generation gap, right? Big differences between kids and parents. Kids and parents get along re really well today. We interviewed 11,000 young people in 10 countries. Look at your iPod and your kid's iPod or your parent's iPod. There's overlap, right? My parents didn't even like the Beatles, let alone the Doors. I mean, what we have today is what I call the generation lap, where kids are lapping their parents on the, on the digital track. And if you've got a teenager in your house, you know what I'm talking about. Who does the systems administration in your home? So. This is creating a very unique situation, and it's humbling, and we fear what we don't understand. That's why these kids get such a bum rap. They're the dumbest generation. They're net addicted, glued to the screen, losing their social skill. Uh, the, they have the attention span of a fruit fly. Uh, they're into this awful drugs and, you know, violent uh, culture. We've created, one book says, we've created a little army of narcissists, Generation Me. All they care about is their YouTube and their MySpace and their Twitter and their... This is a great stereotype. The only problem with it is I've investigated extensively. There's no data to support it. This is the smartest generation ever, actually. Kids are graduating from university like never before. Standard uh, SAT scores are at an all-time high. Um, uh, it's never been harder to get into the best universities. There's a big problem. The bottom third of kids are dropping out of school. But to blame the internet, I mean, that's like blaming the library for ignorance. You know, there are real issues there. They don't give a damn. Actually, youth volunteering amongst high school and university students has been growing year over year for 15 years. Oh, they can be violent. They give their 15 minutes of fame and they beat up somebody on YouTube and, and they're into drugs and all this bad stuff. Actually, youth crime's been dropping year over year for 15 years. And the percent of kids that are clean in high school that don't do either drugs or alcohol has been growing year over year for 15 years. You know what? We fear what we don't understand. And fear gets in the way of doing the right thing. This is humbling. This is a panel I did. This is a big audience, about, I don't know, 6,000 people. And uh, this is uh, of 100 sessions. This is the highest rated session. Out of the mouths of babes. I interviewed these youngsters. On the left there is her half Harfouche. Uh, she was 21 at the time. She was uh, uh, born in Syria, studying in Paris. Her boyfriend's in Toronto. So they turn on video Skype all day long to keep the relationship going. They cook together across the ocean. Um, I asked her, so Rahaf, your generation, do you use email? And she said, oh no, Mr. Tapscott, email is yesterday's technology. And I said, well, if you did use email, what would you use it for? She says, email is sort of like a formal technology, say for sending a thank you letter to one of your friend's parents. <laughs> that would be a good use of email. I, I said, I'll bet you're part of the dumbest generations, title of a book. You probably don't read the newspaper. You don't watch evening news. You probably don't, you probably get your news from Jon Stewart and The Daily Show. I bet you're uninformed and we're lost because of your generation. She says, well, actually, I don't think that's a fair stereotype. I think I'm informed. But you're right, Mr. Tapscott, I don't read the newspaper. And then she's getting it back. She says, but Mr. Tapscott, have you ever seen one of those things, a newspaper? They come out once a day. <laughs> 
They don't have hot links, they're not multimedia. And you know what, you get this weird black stuff on your fingers. <laughs> she says, You're, let me tell you how I get informed. She's describing her RSS and tweeting environment. I said to her, um, well, and then she says, but you are right, I don't read the, I don't uh, listen to the evening, or watch the evening news on television, but does anybody? Sam Donaldson told me the average age uh, of this ABC Nightly News is 64. She says, and you are right, I do watch The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, but not to get the news. I don't think The Daily Show would be funny unless you know the news. Two down from her is Sherry Kong, 80, uh, 80 students in New Zealand. She's one of them, she's 20. She's been hired by the government. Their job, all these students, to teach the teachers how to use the internet in the classroom. I said to her, what are the teachers like as students? She says, oh, Mr. Tapscott, they're, they're awful. They talk in class, they don't do their homework. And beside her is Michael Furtick, the granddaddy of them all. He was 28 at the time. I've known Michael since he was 13. When he was 13, he was the project manager on my website, growingupdigital.com. They made him the project manager as a 13-year-old because he was the oldest and most experienced on the team. When Michael was 15, his own website was getting 20 million page views a month, so he sold it for an undisclosed seven or eight figure US dollar sum. One of the news reports said it was probably only a million dollars, and I sent him an email and said, Michael, you sold it for a million dollars, you should have called me. And he wrote back and he said, Don, legally, I can't tell you how much I sold it for, but I can tell you I'm very happy. And uh, he didn't want the money to buy a Ferrari, although he bought a cheap little car, but his mum had to drive around with him. <laughs> so he only had his learner's permit. He wanted the money to invest in his next new venture. It's called takingitglobal.org. Hundreds of thousands of young people on a social network that want to change the world. You put those two together and you get a social revolution. Now it's not just that there are 850 million people on Facebook approaching a billion soon. But social networking is becoming a new mode of production, kind of like the industrial age had the machine as its mode of production. And it's beginning to change the way that we orchestrate capability in society to do things. Now, just a couple of humbling stories on this. I wrote a book uh, four years ago called, uh, ago called Wikinomics with Anthony Williams. And um, for Christmas, I gave my 20-year-old son, Alex, an advanced copy of the book. I gave him some other things for Christmas, too. Okay. He says, thanks, Dad. He goes off, he starts reading the book. He comes back a couple hours later. He says, hey, Dad, this is a good book. It's like he's surprised or something. And he says to me, I think I'll create a community on Facebook. And Facebook was just becoming, moving from an edu to a dot com. It's close to five years ago. And so um, I said, can I watch? And he said, sure. 15 minutes later, he's got the Wikinomics community. Another 15 minutes later, he's got six members. By the time reading Turkey on Christmas night, he's got 137 members in seven countries, seven regional coordinators, a president, secretary, and chief information officer. He sent out a PDF of the first two chapters of the book. Before I'm eating Christmas dinner, I got kids writing in saying, oh, Mr. Tapscott, we found errors in your book. And the community is placing demands on me. One kid writes and he says, exactly how is Mr. Tapscott going to be contributing to our community? <laughs> what is this? Two words, self-organization. Do you remember two words, Ms. Todd? Self-organization. It's been around throughout all of human history. Language was a function of self-organization. There was no central committee of the English language that said this would be called a glass. It just kind of happened. But what used to take place over centuries and millennia can now happen, well, on a single Christmas day. And you understand this, good things can happen. Barack Obama did, and he changed the way elections uh, will be conducted forever. Did he change the way you govern? Or do we still have the you vote, I rule industrial model of democracy? Probably not, and that hurt him. But again, humbling story. I, I, <laughs> The campaign was just starting. Somebody sent me an email saying, you know this senator from Illinois thinks your book is the key to winning the presidency and transforming America. Go to mybarackobama.com. So I go there, there's my book. 
on the screen, it's like we believe in the principles of self-organization, the use of the internet every way possible, and the use of the book Wikonomics, and, and I'm asking you to believe not just in my ability to bring about real change in Washington, I'm asking you to believe in yours, and, and I looked at this thing, well, my first reaction was, I am the man. <laughs> but not so fast, Don, because it turns out I'm not the man. Because there's also, I find, a single moms who support daycare for Obama community, and there's a young firefighters for Obama community, and there are 35,000 other communities that self-organize, and that's what brought them to power. Now this is a revolutionary force, and I use that term advisedly. See, right now, there's a revolution underway in revolutions. And you know the big debate on this. Who, who knows about Malcolm Gladwell's article that the revolution will not be tweeted? Okay, a number of you. Well, he said, you know what? Real change comes about through strong ties, not through weak ties. It's one of the criticism of the Coney movement is we have a bunch of weak ties here. Um, and therefore, social media cannot contribute to social change. He called people on Facebook slacktivists. They're not bringing about real change. And uh, so people like me said, actually, no, uh, all ties in society that are strong begin as weak ties, with one exception, the relationship between a mother and her baby. That one starts off strong from the get-go, even though that one's incubated for a while. But I said, if we can build this massive network whereby weak ties can become stronger, real change can happen. It was a good debate, and then it was settled. One word, Tunisia. Social media didn't cause the Tunisian revolution. It was caused by oppression. Actually, a disparity between expectations and reality. It didn't create the Tunisian revolution. It was, the revolution was created by Tunisians, in particular, a new generation of young people who didn't want to be treated as subjects anymore more and who wanted hope. But it was very critical in the whole thing. And peop many people don't really understand. It wasn't about getting placards into the street or mobilizing. In Tunisia, snipers, as they are today in Syria, were shooting unarmed protesters in the streets. So the kids took their mobile devices, took pictures, triangulated them, sent them to friendly military units who came in and take out the snipers. You think the, inter uh, the social media is about hooking up online? It actually can be a military tool to defend unarmed people from murders associated with a tyrannical regime. So, had all kinds of other names besides Tunisia, Bahrain and Egypt and Mubarak found out the hard way about that as did Muammar Gaddafi and, and Yemen and a lot of these are still unresolved and, and Jordan and Algeria and Syria and so on. Now this is not simple. It's like the Kony case. These wiki revolutions as I've called them happened very quickly. Up until a year ago all revolutions in human history had a leader whether it was Robespierre or George Washington or Che Guevara or Mao Zedong, when the old regime fell, there was a leadership prepared to take power. These things happen so fast they leave a vacuum, and politics abhors a vacuum. And the danger, of course, is that that vacuum will be filled by negative forces, the old regime being the best candidate. So we need to use social media to rebuild our institutions and to actually create organizations that can do things like win elections. We'll come back to that at the end. Now the final change is a big change in business and in our economy. That there was a Nobel Prize winning economist 80 years ago named Ronald Coase and he wrote a paper where he asked a deceptively simple question. He said, why does the firm exist? If Adam Smith is right and the open market's the best mechanism to determine how goods and resources are allocated, why isn't everybody an independent contractor at every step in production? Why do we all work for companies? And he said the answer is, and he won a Nobel Prize for saying that, the answer is transaction costs. Now he defined that broadly. He really was referring to the cost of collaboration. He said the cost of search in an open market. This is like 80 years ago. of a corporation where we have filing cabinets to find people and so on. 
And he was right, the big industrialists had within the boundaries of the Ford Motor Company, for example, a power plant, steel mill, shipping company, glass factory, why? Because the cost of transactions and collaboration in an open market were greater than the cost of doing things inside the boundaries of the Ford Motor Company. So some of you may know, I wrote a, a book called Paradigm Shift a couple of decades ago, and I said, well, just a second here. The boundaries of the corporation are becoming more porous. I call it the extended enterprise due to a whole bunch of factors, a big one being information technology. Then we saw the rise of the internet and transaction costs drove the unbundling of the vertically integrated corporation into networks. Cisco figured this out, they succeeded, their competitors did not, they fell behind. And now the internet and social media is dropping transaction and collaboration costs so much that peers can come together and create value. You're a bunch of peers in this room. Peers, in the sense of within an organization cutting across the old silos. Peers in the sense of companies acting as peers rather than as superiors and subordinates in a supply chain. And the crazy one is peers outside the boundaries of a traditional company. So if you can, if you can create an a encyclopedia with a million people, it's in 240 languages, it's 10 times bigger than Britannica, Nobody owns it, but the quality is just as good as Britannica, according to the big study that's been done. What else could you create? Could you create a computer operating system? Well, the Linux operating system is created by thousands of programmers they've never met. Linux now dom dominates medium and large computers, and as of the last month, it dominates mobile devices. Linux just announced a big new adopter, big new customer, China. Imagine that, you're the salesperson on the China. <laughs> hey boss, <laughs> I've got this new customer, China. Yeah, really big. A lot of users, a lot of users. Could you create a physical good through peer production? Is it possible that social media is becoming social production? Well, the Chinese motorcycle industry is dozens of little companies. They all cooperate together. They meet in tea houses and on the internet. There's no Harley Davidson. There's no company. There's no OEM pulling all the strings. This is now 40% of global motorcycle production to get ready for the $1,000 car from China using the same model. This is a huge change in the deep structure and architecture of the corporation and how we get capability to innovate, to create goods and services. And I'm gonna end this part with a story. See this guy here? I actually know this guy really well because he's my neighbor. His name is Rob McEwen. He moved across the street from me and he held a cocktail party to meet the neighbors. And um, he said, you're Don Tapscott. I read some of your books. I said, great, what do you do? He says, well, I used to be a banker and now I'm a gold miner. He's a funny guy, he introduces his wife, Cheryl, to me, he says, Cheryl, she's a gold digger. But uh, actually, he can only do that because she's an enormously capable person <laughs> with a sense of humor. But anyway, he tells me this amazing story. He's taken over this gold mine in northern Canada and his geologist can't tell him where the gold is. So he gives him a whole bunch of money for more geological data. They can't tell him where to go into production. He gives them more money. They can't tell him where the gold is. After a few years, he's ready to give up, shut the whole thing down. But he has an epiphany one day. He wonders, if my geologists don't know where the gold is, maybe somebody else does. So he does a radical thing. He takes his intellectual property, which in the mining industry is your biggest secret. It's kept in safes and high security computer systems. He publishes on the, uh, and, and he holds a contest on the internet called the Gold Corp Challenge. Challenge. It's basically uh, half a million dollars for anyone who can tell me, do I have any gold? And if so, where is it? <laughs> he gets submissions from all around the world. They use techniques that he's never heard of, and for his half a million dollars in prize money, Rob McEwen finds $3.4 billion worth of gold. And the market value of his company goes from $19 million to $10 billion, and today the value of Gold Corp is approaching $40 billion. And I can tell you, because he's my neighbor, he's a happy camper. <laughs> he just bought a new car. <laughs> he behaved differently. He adopted a new set of principles. And he embraced the internet to change the way you get capability 
to do something like mining gold. That's why I love that story so much. It's got nothing to do with hooking up online or, or, or websites or anything like that. It's like finding gold in the ground. You know, the winners used techniques that he'd never heard of. In fact, a lot of companies did. The winner was a computer graphics company that built a three-dimensional model of the mine so he could helicopter around underground and see where the gold is. So technology, demographics, social, and economic have all come together at this unique point in human history to not to create a burning platform. You know the, the analogy, right? A burning platform is when a whole bunch of things happen leading to the cost of staying where you are being greater than the cost of moving to something radically different. We have a burning platform now in the world. So five principles. I want to make sure we have time for a conversation here, so I'm just going to go through this very quickly. Collaboration. It's not about a bunch of people having a nice meeting. It's collaboration that can occur on an astronomical scale. Transparency. Lots of people are burnt out of shape about WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks is the tip of the iceberg. This is a new age of transparency where companies and governments are going to be naked. And overall, this is good because if you're going to be naked, well, fitness is you know, it's no longer optional. You gotta get buff. And so transparency is like sunlight. It's the best disinfectant. And when you embrace it, really good things happen. Sharing intellectual property. IBM, rather than fighting Linux, gave away $400 million of software to the Linux movement. They created a platform on which they built a multi-billion dollar business. They adopted Linux and saved themselves a billion dollars a year developing their own operating system and they changed the competitive dynamics in the industry. Interdependence. If there's one thing this crisis ought to tell us, it's that business can't succeed in a world that's failing. And it's not good enough for people on Wall Street to say, you know, the purpose of a bank is to make money for its shareholders and its executives. No, banks exist in society to perform a function, to keep money safe, to lend money to entrepreneurs, to make markets. And we give them a license to do that. And if they violate that license, then we should withdraw it and find another way to make that capability available to society. The banks are changing. I'm giving the opening talk to TEDx Wall Street at the end of this month. It's at the New York Stock Exchange, and I can hardly wait. <laughs> I'm thinking of wearing a flak jacket or something, though, when I'm there. And finally, integrity. Being honest, considerate, accountable, abiding by your commitments. We need to have integrity as part of our bones. And we've had institutions that lack that. We build these institutions around a new communications medium and these five principles and we can rebuild our world. So let me just, each, each one of these is a discussion. I'd be happy to talk about them, but I'm gonna pick one, because the Wall Street Journal wrote an article saying this is what I was talking about today, so I guess I better talk about it. Um, and that's the issue of uh, democracy. So we have an old model, right? It's the industrial age model, you vote, I rule. The way it go, it's going down is that Okay, I'm a politician, listen to this 30 second negative ad where I attack my opponents around issues as a young person that you could care less about, and then you go vote for me and then I'm gonna broadcast to you for four years and we get to do it over again. Actually, it's not quite true that I'm gonna spend all my time broadcasting to you. 80% of my time I'm gonna spend raising funds because that's what politicians do. And I'm really sorry about the way I vote, but <laughs> the people who put me here you know, are kind of important to me. Uh, what's wrong with this picture? Basically everything. You know what? Young people have integrity. They care a lot. They've got great values. They're volunteering and they're not voting. There's a crisis of legitimacy shaping up for our democracies around the world. And it's so ironic because half of the world is clamoring for democracy and the other half that has it says the industrial is increasingly saying the industrial model doesn't work. It's broken and we need to fix it fundamentally. So what could we do? Why not move to a new paradigm in democracy? I'm not talking about direct democracy. We have representative democracy for good reason. 
Remember Ross Perot in the electronic town hall? You get to vote every night on the evening news? Bad idea. Democracy is a lot more than majority rule on a nightly basis. One of the things it's about is protecting the rights of minorities. But could we move to a new model where citizens become engaged? So, Habitat Jam was a conversation with 40,000 people that occurred over three days. IBM's done a conversation with half a million people. In South Africa, there was a jam, a digital brainstorm, involving a huge part of the entire population, and anyone could participate that could get access to, to some technology. And the entire country was involved. Now, of course, there's a digital divide, and we can talk about that if you want, but these are implementation challenges. They're not reasons to not bring about fundamental change. So, the first wave of democracy, we created these these representative institutions, but there was a, um, but, but there was a weak public mandate and inert citizenry. We could build a second wave where we have strong representation, but a new culture of public deliberation and one of active citizenship. What a time of great opportunity. And we need to do this to make our democratic institutions legitimate. So I've been involved uh, in the city of Bogota doing this at the, uh, at the city level. The city government um, a year ago was collapsing. It was corrupt. The mayor was on his way to jail. The main contractor to build the transportation system spent the money and then disappeared. And so the Chamber of Commerce intervened to engage the citizens of Bogota in the reinvention of the city. And I participated in this, where we took them through a process of trying to figure out what are the right techniques. You got challenges, they're like glorified contests, like Rob McEwen did. Digital brainstorms, three-day conversation of the entire population of a city, electronic town hall meetings, micro actions. There are a dozen new techniques that we can now use to reinvent the fundal modus operandi of the democratic process. And what happened was thousands of ideas came in and the candidates for mayor were challenged with these ideas and they weren't just motherhood they were like okay mr mayor candidate would you or would you not adopt the international development bank's software for open procurement for all government tendering yes or no it's not complicated see si or no so they all had to say see si. so now the chamber of commerce can hold their feet and the citizens can hold their feet to the fire to make sure that this happens they adopt that software it's going to be much much harder to be on the take what an unbelievable time in history. A time of vast opportunity and a time of great danger and peril. You know, I travel around in business circles. If I'm talking to executives, ah, these Occupy people, you know, a bunch of hippie radical, or mama, dope smoking anarchists. You know what? That's a big mistake to think that that's what Occupy is about. This is a reflection, the tip of the iceberg, of a social conflagration that is going to rip across the world like a prairie storm, with the internet being the dry wind that's blowing it. And if we don't reinvent these institutions so that young people can have a future, can have social justice and a prosperous life, then we're going to see a a explosion around the world that's going to make the 1960s look like kid stuff. And uh, you know what? I'm on the side of the young people on this because they have the power now and at their fingertips they have the, the tools to find out what's going on, to organize other, uh, 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 to organize collective responses. And they have the values collectively to rebuild these institutions around a new model. So this is a time of great change. Four drivers leading us to big changes in our institutions. And when you get a paradigm shift like this, you get a crisis of leadership. And the people at the top of these institutions are typically not the ones to bring about leadership. Because for starters, the person at the top can't learn for the organization as a whole anymore. And often, vested interests fight against change. And, and the leaders of the old are often the last to embrace the new. Leadership is going to come from everywhere. This is an age of participation, 
where we can all be involved in this change. So you look out at the world today and you see a million problems and it seems to be getting worse. We have a turning point in front of us and it's door number one and door number two. And the future is not something we should predict. We can achieve a new future by taking the right choices. So I'd like to end with a short uh, little um, video, some guys that we work with, to if we could run that uh, video, please. Towards the end of macroeconomics, Anthony and I started wondering, we've seen all these human examples, but what would a age of networked intelligence look like? Can we have the video, please? Um, and so we'd, we'd studied organizations, we decided that we would go to nature. And uh, sheep come in schools and, uh, uh, sorry, in flocks and fish come in schools. Starlings come in something called a murmuration. And in the cold nights over the moors of, of England, the starlings are out over a 20 mile radius doing their starling thing, foraging for food and so on. And at night they come together and they create this spectacular thing, one of the most spectacular sights in nature. And the murmuration refers to the murmuring of the wings of the birds. And it has a function, multiple functions. It warms the birds up for the cold night ahead, but it also protects the birds. You can see on the right of this shot here, a hawk, a predator being chased away by the collective power of these little birds. Scientists that have studied this say they've never seen an accident. And there's leadership, but there's no one leader. It's constantly changing. And this thing is functioning according to the principles that I just described. It's a huge collaboration. There's a sharing of information about location, but about other things like food sources and so on. There's a great interdependence that somehow the, the birds understand that their individual interests is linked to the interests of the murmuration as a whole. And there's this awesome, integrity that gives the birds great courage to take on a fearsome predator. And when the moment is right, the spectacular thing happens. Is this some kind of fanciful analogy? <laughs> Could we actually learn something from this? Is it possible that if we connect ourselves to these vast networks of glass and air around the world, that we could go beyond just exchanging information and knowledge to start to share our intelligence. Can we create some kind of consciousness that extends beyond an individual, a, a group, a community, a, an organization, a society? If we could, we could do some spectacular things. You know, I look at those kids today, the streets of Syria that are being killed as we speak, and I see this thing. During the Egyptian revolution, People said, no, my bark's too strong. The kids are gonna give up. They're gonna go home. And I argued, no, they won't. Because if they go home and if they give up, he will hunt them down and he will kill them. Just as if this thing breaks up, that hawk is gonna have a field day. I look at this thing and I don't know, I get a lot of hope that maybe this smaller world that our kids inherit might actually be a better one and that the age of networked intelligence could be an age of uh, promise fulfilled and of peril unrequited. So, <clears throat> philosopher George Santayana said, we should welcome the future for soon it will be the past, but we should respect the past for it was once all that was humanly possible. We did what was possible in the industrial age and it's now possible to go forward. And it was Victor Hugo who said, there's nothing so powerful as an idea whose time has come. The time has come for a new medium to enable a new generation to transform civilization. And hopefully the time has come for each of you to find that uh, leader within you, to change your organization, your community, and in doing so, to change the world. I'll tell you one thing for sure, is the next period will not be boring. So, thank you very much.
So, uh, we have some time. We can go a little bit over four because we started uh, late. Um, and if we could put that final slide with the 16 cubes up on it, that might stimulate people. But I'd be happy to ask uh, any question. I don't know if we have, do we have roving mics? Um, it looks like not. So just ask your question and I'll repeat it to the audience. Start here. Okay, so the question is, if this is a desired future that I'm describing, what does the transition look like? Do, do we need to break down these old institutions and destroy them uh, and build something out of the ashes, or, or is there a different kind of transition? This is one where it's gonna depend a lot on what we do and what our leaders do. You know, the transition from agrarian feudal society to industrial capitalism was a very violent one. Now, all around the world, it was punctuated by revolution. That's what the French Revolution was, a new class that had access to knowledge against an old church and state that wanted the feudal power. That's what the American Revolution was. I was in Latin America recently. I saw a big statue of Bolivar. All the national democratics, all uh, revolutions all across Latin America were this transition from an agrarian feudal age and a set of institutions to a new industrial age based on uh, with uh, democracy and so on. Um, I'm not suggesting we all arm ourselves, as far be it from that. I think that leadership can occur in every kind of institution. I mean, I've documented a story of a secretary who was a key person in the transformation of, of a division of one of the most important banks, moving that bank towards a whole new that division towards a whole new collaborative platform, a whole new modus operandi along the lines that, that I've described. She's a clerical secretary, was a leader for that change. So, you know, there are a lot of young people here and, and I speak often to graduating classes. I tell them, by all means, go out, be prosperous, have a good life, um, but we need more from you than that. We need you to try and live a, uh, a principled life of consequence where your life has a purpose and it's consequential in achieving this kind of uh, transition. So there's an opportunity for every one of us to participate and to avoid some kind of catastrophic. If, the, if we come together by the millions and billions, then, um, then we can bring about this change. Right here. Can you throw the mic in there? One of the key outcomes of the uh, industrial age has been the, the nation state, the modern nation state as we know it. And if there is anybody who's fighting back against uh, what we see today, it is the nation state, whether it's developed democracies like the US or India or more feudal or tyrannical societies, but how do you see the nation state responding and evolving? And is there a future for the nation state at all in its current form? Yeah. Um, well, the nation state will be around, at least in my lifetime. But it's a great question because the nation state came out of the transition from feudal agrarian society that were based on city states um, to industrial capitalism. You know, Italy wasn't a nation state until, what, 150 years ago or something like that. And we had these national economies, so we created boundaries around them, and, and they had a, a, a na national institutions and governments and the rule of law and, and armed uh, the power of the state and, and uh, an external policy and internal policy. It was a good idea, nation states for national economies, except for this little detail that we now have a global economy. So the nation state is the wrong fit. It's the wrong size for solving these global problems. So what does the new model look like? Well, it's, it's a big research project I've got underway right now. Uh, it's um, being conducted with the World Economic Forum. I'm chairing this working group on new models of global problem solving and global governance that are based on the internet. And what we have now is all these multi-stakeholder networks where people are just self-organizing. They're not state 
driven institutions like the World Bank or the UN or the IMF or whatever. They're just people that are making it happen, whether they're Kiva that's raising hundreds of millions of dollars to, to, to microfinance uh, farmers in sub-Saharan Africa to get a $70 pump. A farmer with a $70 pump can irrigate, irrigate a field. Somehow the World Bank can't get that pump to the farmer, but Kiva can, created by a couple of people. It's a total self-organizing thing. Or whether it's more grandiose things like the Clinton Global Initiative or the World Economic Forum itself that are trying to address these problems. We've got a lot going on. Now, having said that, as I pointed out with the Coney campaign, there are a million problems. I mean, the Clinton Global Initiative may be inspired, but is it legitimate? Who's it accountable to? Um, how do you get to participate? We don't even have a taxonomy yet to talk about these things. So stay tuned. I'll be publishing. I'm, I'm writing about this thing a lot. Other questions right here. No, oh, sorry, let's go to the mic back here, and then, then we'll just come to you, OK? okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Don. Uh, Alex Howard from O'Reilly Media. You know me as Digifile on the uh, interwebs. Oh, cool. uh, so you talked a lot about open, open government, open source, open innovation, also known as crowdsourcing. Uh, you've written about it in macroeconomics. Um, now you've talked a lot more about open data. And a lot of governments are interested in that. A lot of nonprofits are interested in that. It's this big thing, right? Uh, the, kind of the, the question that a lot of people who are in charge of that data are asking, though, is um, what value will be gained for them from releasing it, what value would be gained for society by releasing it. So as you look around the world, as you do, what green shoots are you seeing in terms of entrepreneurs building things that matter for citizens? And what uh, opportunities are there for business people in terms of creating sustainable things, sustainable apps, websites, services, et cetera, uh, for citizens with it? OK, it's a great question. In my talk, I talked about changes to democracy. What's being raised here is a related but different issue, and that's cha changes to the nature of government itself and how we get capability in society to create public value. And I think because of this whole open data movement and other things like that, we're moving into a period where the division of labor in society is changing. We've got the state, we have the private sector, we have the civil society, and then we have the new fourth pillar of society, which is you. The individual. You can be a pillar in society. So these two kids in Boston during the Haitian earthquake went onto the Ushahidi network, found a seven-year-old girl buried in the rubble. She was dying. She'd been there for days. She was able to text something in Creole. They translated it. They geolocated her. They, um, they advised the authorities. They came in. They saved her life. So these, these pillars of society can now work on a new platform. Tim O'Reilly, probably more than anybody, popularized that idea as a government as a platform. And here's, here's, here's the, uh, the idea, really simply. The industrial age model of government went like this. Not democracy, government. I'm a government leader. Uh, I take taxpayers from you citizens. I have people with inside my boundaries. They create services. They deliver the services back to you. We hope you enjoy the services. You're a passive recipient of them. The new networked intelligence model is that that'll continue, of course, but I'm a government and I have myriad, tens of thousands of categories of data that I collect. And I'm now going to release that data just in raw data format. You know, Tim Berners-Lee uh, invented the web. I was with him um, a couple of uh, months ago at MIT. And uh, uh, we, we were reminiscing about, at a TED talk, he had the whole audience standing up and, and shouting, raw data, raw data. He just released this data. And then private companies, civil society organizations, other government agencies, and individuals will self-organize to use it to create public value. So I'll just give you a just a tiny little example. I was sitting with the mayor, not the mayor, the CEO of Melbourne in Australia. They have a CEO there. And I said to her, give me an example of some data that you have as a government. She looks out the window and she says, bicycle accidents. The police have all kinds of data about bicycle accidents. I said, great, just release it right now, raw data. Of course, not with the names. You want to protect the privacy of the individuals. 
I said, release it within 48 hours. Someone will do a Google Maps mashup of the data and cyclists will stay away from the places where cyclists get killed in Melbourne. You'll be saving lives within a week. It costs you nothing. It will cost government nothing. So this is not some little trick. This is a, a, a very different way of thinking about how you get capability to create public value and public services. We could go on quite a bit about, about this. This is a great topic. But let's get another question. We've got one here and then back to the mic. Uh, a few months ago, there was a bit of an uproar with Google Plus around um, roles and identity. And so I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit to, I guess, the risks and role of identity and an anonymity in the uh, network age. Um, well, I have what's now, I think, becoming a minority point of view, that I think privacy is a really important foundation of society and that we need to protect it. And the way to protect it is not just by understandings amongst all of us and even laws governing how data is used, but we need to protect it by data minimization, that we shouldn't be giving away so much stuff. And uh, you know, Jeff Jarvis and I are just starting to have a big debate about his book um, uh, where he argues the, sort of the opposite of privacy is publicness, and it's a good idea. You got Mark Zuckerberg saying this, that if we all just release all our personal data. See, transparency is not just an opportunity for individuals or institutions, it's an opportunity for us people. And we should just share all this data with, with the world and with, with the big benefits, for sure, of sharing some data. And uh, if we do that, we have a single profile. I tell you as much about me as I tell my wife about me. We'll all just be better people, and we're not going to cheat on our spouses, and the world will just be a better place. I think this is a very dangerous idea. Privacy is the foundation of a free society, and in some ways it's the foundation of the concept of the self. And, you know, it wasn't that long ago that we had fascism, we had McCarthyism. We assume that governments are benevolent. I think that's a big mistake. You got big brother. Then you got the problem of little brother, which is, all these corporations that are collecting all this data and they're arguing that we should all be open about our data but they're not very open about what they're doing with it. Data should be collected for the purpose for which it was collected and it should not be used for other purposes without the permission of the person who gave the data. And if I give that data and it's used for commercial purpose, I want some commercial benefit out of it. I might even want to get paid. But now the whole privacy world has been thrown on its head because we have this thing, I haven't written about this yet, but I'm going, I'm going to call it baby brother. The problem is not just government and corporations, it's all of us that are willfully sharing all this unbelievably personal information. I think there are thousands of young people this year who will not get that dream job because someone did a reference check. And fine, you can say, well, if a company's not going to hire me because I was underage drinking or I'm a, you know, our rugby team, all us guys are wearing dresses or, you know, I'm caught with a joint on Facebook or something like that, then I don't want to work there. Fortunately, um, there are a lot of people that are being very um, disappointed in the job market right now. So I'm of the view that data minimization, you don't want to keep everything as minimal as possible, there are trade-offs. You give this data, you get some benefit back from it. But I think that each of us needs to be vi vigilant to decide very consciously to design our information environments so that we keep some things private. We're done. Um, can we take one more quick one? We can't. I'm going to hang around and I'm also uh, doing a book signing right after this. So uh, be uh, delighted, and I have office hours too if you go onto the South by Southwest uh, site. Uh, thank you very much.